Career Week. We are here. It's Friday. TGIF. Congratulations uh, to the School of Professional Studies for a fantastic week. This year's Career Week. You know, when I started doing Career Week, you know, 10 years ago in my career, I've been a director for this is my 11th year. Career Week was one employer table, one day a week, something very simple. Um, this week we had 50 sessions. We had 97 speakers. We had 98 employers with tables recruiting. But we had 160 organizations represented. We had an innovation challenge. We had a video business card program, which was a result of an elevator pitch competition. So 10 students won their own video business card, and they got filmed live, walking down Times Square on College Walk. <laughs> what else did we have? A social media day, which was probably one of the more fun days. And uh, we actually debuted our first Ask CDL show, episode one, which Nicole, my assistant director, hosted. What else did we have? Virtual recruiting event, which was on a Friday, which is happening right now. Our students will be joining us for some of the keynotes, though. We have a, we had this morning, we had a, well, we, al we also had a career fair, right? You got to have a career fair. So that was Monday, the in-person career fair. We had panels. We had career development workshops. We had webinars. So a total of 50 sessions, huge success. Last year, our theme was, well, what we did is we took two themes and put them together, the future of work and meaningful work, right? These are some of the trends that we're seeing in career services. Um, in our career services paradigm that we find ourselves in. And I argue that alumni relations is also in a paradigm um, as well. So it's nice to have alumni relations and career services here. Our theme this week was career disruption and impact. So we wanted to sort of allow that week for today to be a culmination of the week. And this morning, I met with all of the Columbia University Career Services folks downstairs. And what we talked about was, first of all, we talked about collaboration, but we also talked about, it doesn't make any sense for us to talk about career disruption and impact if we're not talking about our own jobs in career services. And so historically, the word career has been defined as what? A job undertaken for a significant period of time with opportunities for progress. But we've seen people now change careers more and more frequently. Our own careers have not been linear. So if change is so evident, what are we doing to change ourselves to better coach and assist our students of tomorrow? And so this week has completely subverted, subvert sort of the, the historical, com historical definition of, of, of a career. And that was our goal. We wanted it to historically sort of change the definition collectively um, at Columbia University. And so we opened up Career Week to other career centers the way it should be. The way it should be. We should always be asking ourselves what's best for our students. So my vision, having spearheaded this week, is that maybe one day, Career Week, maybe we'll rename it, will be <clears throat> a collective effort um, of university career services, especially Columbia University centers. It's possible. Let's do it. Today is also very special for me because I have two of my own mentors um, with us today. And these are mentors who have been mentors to me for many years, organically. The one that you're about to meet, Julian Gordon, is somebody who has inspired me on a very personal level. Uh, not only did he have limiting beliefs growing up with his parents saying, you, you know, I want you to be a doctor like my family. And that those are also my own limiting beliefs. But he's also faced the barrel of a gun, like I faced a, the muzzle of a machine gun one day. So there's a lot of things that really resonated with me with his story and mine early on. But as a career services coach, I was looking at resumes one day. And I would get these emails, these resumes emailed to me, right? We all do. And we're supposed to offer feedback without even meeting the student face to face sometimes. And I just, it just didn't sit well with me one day. And I said, how am I supposed to, to give feedback if I don't even know what this job really meant to that student? If 
I don't even know who that person is, if I don't even know what that purpose, the purpose was for that person, what kind of impact did they make in that position? I said, we're, just, we're doing resumes all wrong. You know, resumes are already going to be a thing of the past. And people used to make fun of me when I talk about video resumes. And now it's evident. Now it's all over the place. So I started looking online and at juliangordon.com. And all of a sudden, I, I see this amazing video of you know, somebody talking about freedom and connecting passion to purpose. And it impacted me on a personal level, on a professional level. And I gave homework to all my staff saying, you got to watch this video. We have to help students connect passion to purpose. But not only that, you can be passionate about a lot of things, right? It's not enough to be passionate about something because you can be passionate about things that maybe you're not good at, right? We talked about icky guy yesterday, what you love, what the world needs, you know, what you're good at, etc. cetera, finding that sweet spot. But he was the first person who also said, Hassan, there's a missing link between passion and purpose. There's a missing link with the whole passion concept. Because you, you can't just be passionate about something, you have to master it to solve someone else's problem, right? So you have, to, you have to find your passion, and you find out sometimes after you're doing it, but then you have to master it. So he taught me many, many things. He's been awesome. I know you're gonna love it. I'm going to introduce him now. I challenged him. I challenged him. I said, I want you to talk about the future of career services. I know you'll enjoy it. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, big warm up round of applause for Julian Gordon. Thank you, thank you, Chief. I got this one, so I'm good. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much to Hassan and his team. I'm so delighted to be here. Um, in fact, my first time in this building was coming here for a panel for the Columbia Business School. And I was saying some things that were pretty challenging to the MBA students and to those who serve them in career services. And I'm probably going to do the exact same thing for you all uh, today. Um, I encourage you to get your pens ready because I'm going to say some things that might be blasphemy in terms of career services. But uh, if you sit with them uh, and sleep on them, I think you'll appreciate what I'm sharing with you and how it's going to help you serve your students at a higher level. Um, the first thing we need to get clear on before we even start the conversation is who's really our customer. Is our customer the companies or is it the student? Who are we really here to serve? Because if you're trying to serve two different interests at the same time, usually one player's interest is going to outdo the other one. And I want to encourage you to always lean towards the side of the students. That's who we're really seeking to serve. And we're not just taking this ball of clay and this ball of talent and trying to pass them to employers because those are the metrics that the uh, university uses to uh, measure your success as a department. So we got to really wrestle with that and that's for you all to take back to your individual departments and your individual campuses. Who's really our customer and who are we going to put first? Johnson & Johnson, they have a credo uh, where they actually outline um, who uh, how they make decisions, right? And it starts with the physicians, and then it goes to the mothers, then it goes to the children, then it goes to the investors. But for most companies, the investor is first, and then it goes the other way around. And so you gotta get really clear on that for who it is that you're really here to serve. And perhaps you're here to serve all parties, but you have to put them in priority. And so I want you to consider putting the students first. So some of you, is that, is that me? Okay, that's fine. Great. <coughs> so some of you may have seen my TED Talk. It has over 350,000 views on it. And it's really about how to maximize college um, and how to graduate on time and make sure that you minimize your debt Today I get a lot more time with you today to go deeper on that conversation. But this journey really all started for me when I was at my little brother's graduation. I have two little brothers, one who's four years behind me and another one who's six years behind me. And he graduated from UC Irvine and all the graduates on the ground floor of the basketball arena and all the guests from the upper deck and um, looking down to try to find my little brother and on the top of one graduate's hat it said hire me. It was at this moment that I realized that higher education was no longer leading students to getting hired. For past generations, it was one graduate to three job offers, right? And today, it's now three graduates to one quality job offer. 
Now, some of your employment statistics, they look good, but when we really go look at the kind of jobs that the students are actually getting, are they actually really gainful employment? <laughs> a student is now working back at the mall, they're employed, and that helps your statistics, but actually, are they in gainful employment? So some of the statistics that we use to measure our success are not really accurate measures of whether or not our students are actually succeeding as a result of going through this experience in our universities. And so that's what actually led me to do this work to, uh, since my little brothers are too hard-headed to listen to me, <laughs> um, I decided to share the message with as many other young people as I possibly could. And what I love about doing this work with you all is because when I go to speak to students, <coughs> excuse me, I have a little cough. Um, when I go to speak to students, I, can only, I only get 60 to 90 minutes with them. And while I only have 60 to 90 minutes with you today, you actually are in the students' lives more than I will ever be. And if we're going to change the culture and the mindset of somebody, it's going to have to be the people who are in their lives on a regular basis, not just somebody who pops in once. I believe in inspiration, but we can't just do inspiration. It actually has to be about transformation. And so I'm so grateful to be speaking to you as opposed to even the students today. So I've done this work. I've spoken all over the country. I went to UCLA for undergrad, where I graduated in three years. Um, then I went to Stanford for business school, where I got my MBA and my master's in education. I was living in New York for 10 years, and I just moved to um, New Orleans two months ago. Um, uh, change in lifestyles. We talk about career and life design. That was a lifestyle choice for me, right? In terms of the affordability, the warmth. <laughs> nice the food. Yeah, it's a nice day today. But it's, New Orleans is still 70-something in New Orleans. <laughs> So these are, this is about lifestyle design. And the reason I stepped into entrepreneurship is because honestly, I couldn't find a career that would allow me to be all of who I was. Do I believe that that career exists? Yes, I believe that that career exists. But I couldn't find it at the time. So I said, since I can't find it, I actually have to go create it myself. And so I believe that you can actually do a better job of helping young people find those careers. But it's likely not going to happen through on-campus recruiting. I'm just telling you that. <laughs> It's actually going to happen through you helping them with independent career searches so that they can navigate that entire city that's out there that you see with this beautiful view and actually find the jobs that are available in each one of those buildings out there. And you actually have to train them how to do that. Okay? So the big difference, <laughs> we have to have some context, right? And the big difference uh, that we're facing is that we're dealing with two different operating systems. We're dealing with two different operating systems. The world has changed drastically. And what we've done with career services, we've tried to apply an old operating system to a new world, right? And you can't use floppy disk today. <laughs> my computer, my computer, it's the, this nice laptop doesn't even have a CD drive on it. And so we've taken old solutions, right, things that worked in the past, so there was nothing wrong about the way you pursued and found your career. Nothing wrong with that, okay? So there's no judgment there. But I'm just saying that today, we live in a brand new operating system, so we have to use new modalities in order to succeed in today's environment and context. Okay? They say you can't pour uh, a new wine into old wineskins or else they will burst. And that's what we've been doing. We've been trying to use the same old tactics to apply to the new economy that's out there, and we're wondering why we're not getting the results that we truly desire. Okay? <coughs> this idea of the American dream the white picket fence and the nuclear family of four, uh, right, with the dog, the lassie, the dog down there. <laughs> <laughs> this is no longer the vision for many of our young people. Um, families are uh, coming in all different shapes, sizes, and forms nowadays, right? So this vision, which may have actually appealed to you, is not actually appealing to our younger generation. So what we've been doing typically in career services, we, we've been using the carrot that motivated us and saying, hey, come do this and come get this good job so you can have this nice house and this white picket fence and send your kids to good schools and get uh, good pay. We've been using the carrot that motivated us to try to motivate somebody else. But what if they don't like carrots? <laughs> we get mad at them for not moving uh, based on what inspired us, but they actually have different motivations. And so the most important thing that you can do as a career service um, professional is actually start to understand what each individual that works with you, what their unique definition of success is. And guess what? Most of them won't even be able to articulate it themselves. And so that's actually part of your work, is to help them articulate what their definition of success is, because that is the greatest motivator of all. <laughs> is once you help somebody get clear on their definition of success, and you're like, OK, this is your, defi your unique definition of success, success now. Okay? And based on what you told me, Right? I'm not trying to persuade you to believe in mine. Based on what you told me, your behaviors aren't aligning with your definition of success. You have to wrestle with that, not me. So either we need to change your definition of success to align with your behaviors, 
or you need to change your behavior to align with your definition of success. So that is the greatest motivator, and so this is some of the work that we have to do. <coughs> this idea of this linear life, as Hassan said, is no longer linear, right? The old American dream was graduate from high school, graduate from college, go to graduate school, get a nice car, get a good job, um, find love, get married, pop out one of these, get a starter home, <laughs> pop out another one of these, upgrade to a, a, a Honda Odyssey, right? <laughs> get a bigger home. How many of you checked off almost all these boxes? Keep it real, right? This is the old American dream. And the younger generation isn't buying into this. The old American dream also said just add more money and things will be good. Guess what? Some of you made some good money in industries out there and you realized that that wasn't the answer. And this is why you left and this is why you're doing career services today. Because you realized that it wasn't about the money. <laughs> the money wasn't actually going to lead you to fulfillment. And what the younger generation is doing is they're seeing that before going through that path. They see it before because they saw their parents make money, do all the things, check off all the boxes and still not be fulfilled and happy, still have a midlife crisis. And so they're saying, no, I saw my parents go down that path. My mom, she went on to be a doctor um, or an anesthesiologist making good money, nice house in Oakland, California, all that. Still saw her deal with alcoholism. Deep down inside, she wanted to be an artist. But there was nobody there holding space for her to tell her that there was a possibility, that art wasn't just in a picture frame. That art is manifest in all kinds of different ways, from the clothes you wear to interior design. Nobody was there to tell her about the possibilities that would allow her to be an artist without it just being defined as something that gets drawn and painted in a picture frame. This is where you all get to step in and actually help and support. So many of our young people, they're dealing with what I call modern day slavery. And all of you are actually conductors to help them uh, escape what I call the undergrad railroad. Mm. And here's what modern day slavery looks like. And this is the student who did everything that they're supposed to do. <coughs> hey, financially illiterate 18 year old, here's a six figure loan to go to college in hopes that you can get a job that was created by someone whose GPA was less than yours. <laughs> can I use that loan to build my own company or invest? Nope, never, you can only use it for college. Uh, to celebrate your new job, you deserve a house. How about this one? You can afford it based on your salary, right? Now, keep in mind, salary is not income though, that's what we've been trained to think. This is part of the trickery of the American dream. Your salary is not your income in a business. What is income? Revenues minus expenses. Revenues minus expenses. How come only one person who had that equation? And I'm she's the college student. student. And she's the student. <laughs> she just had her a a econ test. <laughs> I took finance last semester. Okay, she did corporate finance last semester. If our students don't know this, how can they expect to go get a job? Because the way you get a job today is you have to either prove to an employer that I'm going to create more value than I take. I would happily hire anybody in this room if you could convince me that you were going to create $200,000 in value for my company and only ask me for 100 in terms of your salary. I would hire you on the spot right now if you could prove that to me, without question. That's how you get a job today, <laughs> or at least in the future. That's where we're moving towards, OK? And so granite countertops will look nice in this kitchen. Just sign here, and you'll be a homeowner. Wink, wink. Why are they winking? Because you don't own it. See all these episodes of HGTV, congrats, you're a home owner. No, you're not. You're a home buyer. This is part of the trickery of the American dream. And based on where the American dream was when you all finished school, it was great because of where housing prices were, where the stock market was, you've been all able to ride that wave. Okay? They're actually stepping into that wave when it's at, already at its peak. Now with taxes taking 30% of your salary, student loan taking 30% for the next 10 years, and a mortgage taking 30% for the next 30 years, you're stuck working at a job you realize you hated after one month of working there. Sincerely, modern day slavery. And some of you have been helpful in getting them into this trap. Some of you have been like, yeah, let me hold this door open because this employer is paying us this much to come get access to you and let me just push you down this path. We gotta change who comes first. It has to be students first, okay? So here's a student who did everything that they're supposed to. I know we have NYU, Baruch, uh, Columbia in the building. Mortgage, 325,000. School loans, 120K. Uh, credit cards, 3K. Net worth, almost half a million dollars in debt at the age of 22. And this is a good kid who did everything that they were supposed to do, okay? So we have to change the game. The old American dream is going down the drain. Instead, we need to help them start off with their life design because who you are should define what you do. What you do doesn't define who you are. <coughs> so what does that look like? What is a dream? Rather than dream being this ethereal thing, let's actually define what the dream actually is. 
And the dream is having your desired relationships, your burden earning, having your desired employment, and having your desired money. And for each student that walks into your office, for some students, they value relationships more than they value money. For some, they value employment more than they value relationships. For some, they value uh, the money more than anything. But you have to help them uncover what are their priorities, because that's actually going to shape the career possibilities that are available to them. Because many of them have been going down easy street, which is be good, get good grades, go to a good school, and get a good job. This has been the path. And this is where many of you fit in, right here. Okay. Now, why do they call it easy street? Because it's easy. Most of our young people aren't waking up sweating bullets because class is so hard. There may be times where they procrastinate and they have to write a 10-page paper in two hours. Yes, that moment is hard. But this academic thing, it's not really that hard, y'all. It's not. You're in class, it's 12 to 16 hours a week. It's not that hard. Student shaking her head, she, she agrees. Okay. So here's what changed. For you and their parents, the world was easy to navigate. All you had to do was outcompete the person to your left and your right in your high school classroom, and you'd be okay. You'd be able to have that single family home in New Jersey, right, with the Toyota Camry and the two kids and all that good stuff, right? All you had to do was outcompete the person to your left and your right in your high school classroom. For me, I'm on the older end of the millennial generation. I had to outcompete all the students in the state of California in order to get into UCLA. California's a pretty big state, right? But because of my AP scores, uh, SATs, things of that nature, I was able to get into UCLA. For these young people, they are now competing against everyone in their age group in the entire world. So a lot of times we look at these young people and we say, oh, you got it so easy, all this technology. Here's my question to you. How many of you would trade places with them? Raise your hand if you would trade places with them. So stop, let us stop looking at these young people like they're being entitled and lazy. They're actually disillusioned by the reality of their life. <laughs> and some of them depressed by what they have to compete against. You all never had to compete against a young person in India or China. Never. Never. There are more honor students in India than there are students in the United States in totality. You all never had to compete at that level. So this is the world that they're facing and navigating. And while they may not be able to language it, they can sense it, and they feel it, and they know it, OK? Despite getting great degrees from all of those schools. On top of that, the world is now flat, <coughs> right? We're living in a globalized world. This is me growing up. I had an Encyclopedia Britannica set. <laughs> so if I had a book report to write, I could run downstairs, reference the book, write my report, and turn it in the next day. All my friends who didn't have an Encyclopedia set, what did they have to do? They had to go to the library. So because I had access to information faster than they did, I had an advantage, right? But with Google, Google's mission is literally to make the world's information universally accessible to all people. And they've done a great job of doing that. Here's a young boy in India studying under a McDonald's streetlight. <laughs> Doesn't even have the internet. Studying probably some old textbook from America. Who's hungrier for knowledge and opportunity, this young boy or your students? This little boy will eat them all alive in the global economy. And here's how I know. This is the CEO of Google, an Indian boy, became an Indian man, who is now running an American company. Hmm. It's playing out. It's playing out. And so as we think about the future of career services, we have to be fully aware of this. <coughs> On top of that, a lot of these young people are graduating with an expensive college degree with major debt and minor capital. Hmm. That's their major is debt. They got major debt. Hmm and no capital to show for the four, five, or six years. You know that the, uh, the um, average four-year graduation rate is only 59% uh, nationwide? American narrative is that everybody goes to college and graduates in four years. And while all of you may have done that, it's not even close to the truth. It's not even close to the truth. In fact, most of you don't even know the graduation rates, the four-year or six-year graduation rates for your school. Why are we even measuring six-year graduation rates? It takes seven years to become a pediatrician. Why should it take six years to finish undergrad? So now the student is graduating with 25 to 50% more debt for the same exact 10 cent piece of paper. And then we get this 10 cent piece of paper and we put it in this nice mahogany frame from the bookstore that costs $125. <laughs> now what's more valuable, the 10 cent piece of paper or the mahogany frame? If you took both to a pawn shop, which one are you going to get more money for? The frame. So a driver's license is supposed to mean you know how to drive. That's not always true. <laughs> 
CPR certification means you can apply first aid. College degree, what does it mean you can do? What does it mean you can do? Take tests, write some papers. It demonstrates no skill set whatsoever, right? And some of you at the higher end schools, um, and I know because I went to higher end schools, a lot of it is just creaming. It's the admissions office creaming and then saying, oh yeah, look at these great students that we made, but you just took the best students already. There was no growth or development in them over the course of four years. They're just four years older with five or six figures more debt. Okay? So <coughs> Columbia University, this is on, um, I think, pay scale. Pay scale. Uh, their net ROI over 20 years is 653, so a 6.3% return. Right? Some of you are doing better with your stocks than that. That's a 6.3% return over uh, the four-year cost. Um, their early career salary is 71,000, mid-career is 134, and high meaning is 47. So you can grab this information for all your schools. It's, it's online. It's there. Okay, and you should know it. It should be at the forefront of all your meetings. Okay, so let's just look at a student at Columbia, who saves for four years or six years. They're making 71 straight out. I put a 5% increase in salary each year, but we know that's not really happening. I just put it there because the numbers are so bad. <laughs> Watch this. 25% tax. Okay, after tax they're at $53,000. Monthly that's 4,434. That's still more money than they've ever seen, but with the student loan of this, this is their student loan payment. $3,154. This is exact numbers. I'm not making any of this up, y'all. These are exact calculations. If they want to pay this off in 10 years, this is their student loan payment. So this student has to figure out how to live off of $1,283 in New York. This is the reality. I didn't make any of this up, y'all. And you can run these numbers for your school. Now, if a student takes six years to graduate from Columbia, they're in the negative. They're in the negative. This is what our younger generation is facing. See, <coughs> education has not evolved quick enough to match the economy. <laughs> education, we've been told, is go ride on this tortoise for four years, even though you're this fast-thinking, witty individual, and that at the end of the four years, the doors of the world are going to open to you. And it's just absolutely not true. It hasn't been true for a long, long time. Okay? You were probably the last generation that it was true for. Okay? And we've sold them this vision of Hollywood College, Right? based on these movies, which and this is not really the reality of college. This is maybe 3 to 5% of what college should be about. I want them to have fun. I want them to have these amazing memories, but this is not what college is about, especially when you're putting that much money on the table. Okay? And so here they're feel, they feel safe in this little bubble that we created for them called Columbia or NYU or Baruch with security at the gates and things of that nature. You're in this safe, the failed bubble. And you got money just flowing to you without ever having to work for it. But then you all know that this is what happens right after. <laughs> the bubble burst. <laughs> and we have to love them and care so much that we want them to be ready for when this bubble burst. OK? So shift number one, the entrepreneur reality. That's what we're living in, the entrepreneur reality. <coughs> entrepreneur reality means that uh, we're all already entrepreneurs. The old idea of the 4040 Club, working for one company 40 hours a week for 40 years, is closed. It's done. No more. It's not happening. The gig economy has completely expanded. Jay-Z said it. He said, I'm not a business man. I'm a business man. <laughs> Every individual has to start seeing themselves as a business. So what the entrepreneur reality means is that we are all already entrepreneurs. An employee is simply an entrepreneur with one big client. Many of you only have one big client. If that client were to leave you tomorrow, you'd be in financial jeopardy. We're all already entrepreneurs. We're selling our services to an organization. And once you start to see yourself as an entrepreneur, then you know you have to have a brand and market yourself and be able to get business outside of just your main or your top client. Okay? Nobody in here is sitting on a one-legged chair. You're all sitting on four-legged chairs because it's actually more effective to have multiple streams of revenue than just one. But the American dream has told us to go get one and that companies are loyal. Companies aren't loyal. Companies are not loyal. Where did they, I don't even know how they branded themselves as such. Okay? <coughs> so, again, you are in a, your employer is just your biggest client. The gig economy is uh, in our midst. 11% of working adults in the U.S. Uh, work primarily as independent contractors. 50% um, uh, of U.S. jobs are compatible with remote work. 
20% uh, of full-time and independent contractors um, earn 100000 or more. Um, Part-time and full-time freelancers represent 35% of the U.S. workforce. 7.6 million Americans will work in the on-demand economy by 2020. Um, One-third of professionals globally say work-life balance is getting a little bit more difficult. Only 30% of U.S. employees say they are engaged at work. The on-demand gig economy is in our midst, and we have to get ready for that. And what that means is that a young person has to know how to brand themselves and see themselves as an entrepreneur. And while they may have one big client, they also have the ability to go get other clients on their own. Okay? Shift number two, more uncertainty and undecided. We typically want students to come in and declare a major because that makes our job easier because then we can track them and things of that nature. There's going to be more uncertainty, more disruption, and more undeclared, and more unsure about what I want to do after graduation. And that's going to fall in your lap. That's going to fall in your lap. <coughs> These traditional paths of teacher, doctor, lawyer, engineer, businessman, or businesswoman, that's what colleges were really originally designed for. That's why you got Columbia's teacher college. New York needs teachers. Let's go create a teacher's college. Therefore, we have a teacher's college to prepare teachers for careers. But now we know that careers are popping up every single day. There were no social media marketers 10 years ago, right? Every new innovation creates new problems, which create what? New jobs and opportunities. And we want our students to be ready for those opportunities, but our institutions are so big and bureaucratic that they're not uh, able to evolve quick enough to prepare us to train them for these new jobs. So a lot of our students are going through traffic. Career fair long lines out the door for these big companies that actually do come to campus and recruit. When there's a job, there's like five jobs in that building right there. There's 20 in that building right there. but these aren't sexy names. They're not household names that students are aware of. So they can't tell them, Mom, I work at uh, Ameribur Ameribergen. It's like, who is that? Why aren't you working at Google? Right? But there are jobs there that they could get into. And in fact, if they skip, I didn't do any on-campus recruiting at Stanford. I didn't do any. Because guess what? What if you skipped on-campus recruiting and you just uh, took your talents to a company that never actually on campus did on campus recruiting. You could actually go into that organization and probably be 10th in the organization while all your peers are going to a big company and they're starting out at the bottom. Because this person has never, this company has never seen a Columbia graduate come and approach them to work there before. If you know how to do the independent career search, right? Here's how you know schools aren't evolving quick enough. This school has textile marketing as a bachelor's degree, okay? Now, we're all wearing clothes, so textiles do get marketed. That's not going anywhere, right, unless we're all walking around naked. <laughs> but to have textile marketing and not have digital marketing, even though that we know the economy is shifting towards people buying everything online and on their phone, makes no sense, right? But because of tenure, right, because of tenure, these departments get landlocked, like, no, this is mine, this, I care about this, this is my life's work, and I get to work here forever, even if I don't do anything or evolve. Because of tenure, it's actually stifling innovation in our academic institutions. Okay? Um, <clears throat> when you look at the correlation for careers based on major, there's a core strong correlation for STEM. Okay? But non-STEM, very weak correlations. Very weak correlations. So your major at the end of the day does not matter whatsoever. Okay? It's about the skills you develop. Shift number three, companies will bypass college. This is going to be a rude awakening for many institutions, all these brick and mortars, all this real estate. What employers want to see, they don't really care about your GPA or what school you went to. They want to see that you know how to create value, meaning that you know how to solve meaningful problems, that you know how to get money, meaning that you understand their business model, and that you've led a team of 20 or more. Most students, when I ask them, do they know the revenue or profit equation, most don't know it. So you're telling me you want somebody to hire you, but you don't even know the basic equation for how profit is made. And what is the basis that they're hiring you on? because you got some good grades and you have a good personality? That used to be the case. That's not the case today, okay? Look at this, Ernst & Young, all, you all know Ernst & Young, 2016. <coughs> Ernst & Young removed degree classification from entry criteria as a no evidence university equals success. This is a big accounting firm. Now, do most of their entry level class still have college degrees? Yes, but they are starting to be open to the fact that oh, this whole situation is actually putting more stress on our young employees because now they're paying back debt and we had to retrain them anyways. But it's not just Ernst & Young, Google, Apple, Ernst & Young, Penguin, Random House, Costco, Whole Foods, Hilton, Public, Starbucks, Nordstrom, Home Depot, IBM, Bank of America, Chipotle, Lowe's. 
once 250 Fortune 500 companies say, you know what, we'll bypass this whole college thing, all of this crumbles. We're going to start seeing the sell-off of pieces of real estate. Okay? Impatient with the colleges, employers design their own courses in universities. We have to train them anyways. Apple has its own university. Mars has its own university. Shell, GE, IKEA, they have their own universities. So they're coming down chain. Instead of relying on you to train them, which, uh, and I know it's not you because you aren't the academia side, but instead of relying on these institutions to train them, they say, no, we're just training them ourselves because we got them, but we got to start over from scratch. They still don't know how to write a, uh, a paragraph. Okay? Shift number four, automate and outsource first. That's what these companies are doing. This was 1991, May 1991, worldwide what? <laughs> this is June 2015, okay? Banks turn video tellers to cut costs. <clears throat> if I was a bank teller and I saw the first ATM, I, I'm throwing up the deuces immediately, <laughs> right? <laughs> seriously, seriously. Um, Jeff Bezos, he's not an evil person, but, what did he do? but he's gonna do everything he can to automate everything that Amazon does so that you can get your Amazon Prime thing delivered within like eight hours. <laughs> like they're at 24 now, it's going to be like an eight. I've got something in like three hours before. <laughs> Seriously, like a driver pulled up. I was like, you don't need to say Amazon on his truck. And he just pulled up and was like, here's your package. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> right? So every CEO's dream is to be able to press this green go, but wake up, press go, and not have to deal with people. That's every CEO's real dream. <laughs> they only hire people when they need to hire people. <laughs> so all these jobs at the bottom of the pyramid, right, this capitalistic system, all these jobs, this is what's going to be gone. And this is where colleges are sending students to, graduates to. And I actually think this is a beautiful thing, but it's going to be a hard thing for people who aren't ready. <laughs> the beautiful thing is that when all these lower level jobs are eliminated, it's going to force us all to find what our uniqueness is and step into our purpose. Those who aren't ready for this evolution, it's going to be a very hard time. Okay? So, strategy one for you. <coughs> you will be life designers. And it's not just the career design, you will be life designers. So the skill set that you'll have to have is career and life visioning. Okay? Like I said, who you are should define what you do. What you do does not define who you are. So we have to start with the individual and who they are first. Oftentimes we start with, what do, what do you want to do? We ask people at the age of six, what do you want to do? Huh? And at six years old, we thought we had to have the right answer. Oh, I want to be a firefighter. I want to be a pilot. I want to be a baseball player, right? We used to think we had to have the right answer at the age of six. And we didn't know. We didn't know. A well, better question would have been like, who do you want to be? Not what, but who, okay? So this is what the average life is going to look like. And here's their, one third of their life is gone to sleep. Then you have this free time. You have a lot when you're little, very little when you're working professional. And the game we've been playing with the American dream is retirement over here. Then this is where you have a rare space and time to work with them to shape what this is. If they treat this like a vacation, then this is going to be very hard. If they take full advantage of this opportunity, then this is going to be full of passion and purpose. But they have to take this little four year sliver of space and time really seriously. What we traditionally done in career services, <laughs> is we've had these students as balls of talent with no real skills, and we've been handing them to the employers. Here you go. You get to shape them and their life into whatever you need them to be. This is when we put employers first. When you put students first, you actually show the student that, nope, this is your hands, and this is your life, and you can actually shape your life into whatever you want it to be, and we're going to find employment that actually aligns with your vision for what you want your life to be. That's going to make a lot of your jobs harder. I'm not going to say it's going to make your jobs easier. It's going to make your jobs harder. Because it won't just be like, oh, let's get enough employers to the career fair and we'll be good. Nope. It's going to be a lot more individual work. But you're going to get better and better at these skills that I'm sharing with you today. <coughs> Steve Jobs talks about the importance of passion. Anybody know what Steve Jobs' passion was at the age of 18? Calligraphy. calligraphy. Now, if a student came to you and said, my passion is calligraphy, what would you tell them? Yeah, some of us would laugh, right? But here's what's happening. When we laugh, what we're saying is, I'm, I'm going to let my own limited belief stop you from actually pursuing that. When a student comes to us with some random passion that we've never heard of, we don't know how to monetize, et cetera, 
we let our limited thinking actually cut them off. You say, well, maybe you should try this instead, this and that. We're letting our limiting beliefs stop them from actually pursuing what they actually feel called to pursue. So we have to do a better job at expanding how we see money flowing. Money is flowing all around us right now. You know that, right? Somebody got paid to make this chair. Somebody got paid to paint it. Somebody got paid to make this. Somebody got paid for this yellow thing. Somebody got paid for these lights. Money is flowing around. Money is being made in all different ways. But we've been taught, especially in career services, that the only way to make money is through a job. But money is flowing around us at all times, every single room. If we added up all the money that flo flowed into this room, into all of our outfits, the chairs, the plants, everything, there's millions of dollars in this room right here and right now. But we have limited ways of actually seeing how money can flow into one's life. So we actually have to expand our possibilities. And one way I encourage you to do that is when you pass a company walking through New York, right? A company, its name is on a building. You're like, oh, it's not a household name. I want you to go look it up. When you get to the subway station, I want you to look it up. And I want you to see what they do. What problem are they solving in the world? And the more often you do that, you're going to start to see, wow, there's all these different ways that people are actually solving problems for other companies or for other individuals. It's going to expand your awareness of what's possible, which means that when a student comes into your office and shares with you something that might be off the wall, you actually can make a connection for them between a way that they can actually make a living doing that thing. But if you have a limited idea of what's possible, then when they come to you, they're going to hit a cement wall instead of be stepping into a space of infinite possibility. And that's the role that you were supposed to have. <coughs> so I want to share a distinction, as Hassan talked about, distinction between passions and interests. Okay? So passions have to do with discipline practice, whereas interests have to do with half-hearted play. So if I'm truly passionate about something like pool, I'm gonna, you, could take, you could see me at a pool hall taking the same shot over and over and over again to try to master it. On the next table over, you'll see somebody else just trying to hit it as hard as possible and pray that something goes in. Right? I'm engaged in discipline practice because I'm trying to get better. They're engaged in half-hearted play. The other thing about passion is that passions are full-time, whereas interests are free time. So if I'm truly passionate about something, I'm doing it no matter how busy life is, no matter whether or not it's finals week, I'm still doing it. But if I'm only interested in it, then when life gets busy, I let it fall off. The other thing about passion is that passions are action-oriented, whereas interests are uh, topic-based. And this is oftentimes where majors fit. Okay? So I want to show you how to help them. If I say I have a passion for baseball, what do you think I want to be professionally? Baseball player, that's the first thing that comes to mind, right? But do more than 18 players show up to the field at game day? Yes, right? There are a lot of people getting paid on game day. Watch this. Hitting baseball, pitching baseball, collecting baseball cards, studying baseball history, coaching baseball pitchers, announcing baseball games, managing baseball operations, scouting baseball players. When you get clear about the action, the ING, you can map out the entire economy around an individual's interest. You think about every ING word connected to that particular interest, and you'll start to map out the entire economy and how people are getting paid. Right? And so you weren't good enough to make the baseball team here? That's fine. You, let's see if we can help you get into baseball operations so that you can still be around your passion even though you're not a baseball player. You're not actually hitting a baseball or throwing it or catching it. Okay? Look at the baseball economy. There are the concession people, the mascots, the announcers, the umpires, the players, the coaches, and the owners. There's an entire food chain there. But just because like, oh, you didn't even make the team here and you love baseball, I don't know how we're going to help you. Nope, there's an entire economy around baseball that if we can help them tap into that, we can find an opportunity within that. Okay? <coughs> if I say I have a passion for food, what do you think I want to be professionally? Chef, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Are there more ways to engage food beyond cooking it? Yes. Growing the food organically, writing food reviews, designing food baskets, tasting the food, hosting events around food for the homeless, et cetera, et cetera. There was this woman who hosts a food show. She doesn't even know how to cook. She just has chefs come on to her show, and she's just sampling all the food. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Now, if a student comes to you and says, I'm passionate about designing fruit baskets, what would you say? Their parents probably say, you're a fruit basket. What does edible arrangements do? They design fruit baskets. No Columbia, NYU, or Baruch degree required. And they design $500 million worth of fruit baskets. But because of your limiting belief of what was possible for that student and their own limiting belief, this student now walks out of your office like, man, I'm going to let that thing go. 
You have to hold a space of infinite possibility. You have to want what they want for themselves. You can't have any personal agenda when you truly care about someone. You can't have any personal agenda. You have to want what they want for themselves, unconditionally. This is about love, y'all. <laughs> And if we really love our students, then we're not just looking at them as numbers, we're looking at them as human beings that have a purpose that they're meant to manifest in this world. Okay. So I have a friend who was interested in archaeology, so she thought she wanted to be an archaeologist. Okay. Now what kind of passions are connected to archaeology? What are the ING words? Digging. Digging. History. Studying history. Exploring. Exploring. Preserving. Huh? Preserving, conserving, and preserving, great. So digging for info, searching history, studying people, <coughs> feelings, curiosity, discovery, adventure, okay? So watch this, I'm gonna show you a trick. This is gonna change everything for you all. And you can use this with your students in your office right away, watch this. Boom, what happened? What just happened? The profession disappeared. Some students are going to come to their office and they're going to be locked in on a profession that they think they want. But the only reason they chose that profession is because uh, they thought it was going to give them these things. So what if we just let go of the profession just for five minutes? Let's just let go of the profession for five minutes and look at what it is you're seeking inside the profession. And then let's find other career opportunities because when you're locked in on the profession, you have tunnel vision. But when we start with the passions first, your career possibilities expand. What could this person be now? A little bit more specific than anything. <laughs> what could they be? Career advisor. Career advisor. <laughs> huh? Search engine optimization. Search engine optimization. Great. Archaeologist. Recruiter. Recruiter. Historian. Historian. Beautiful. Archaeologist, psychologist, journalist, investigator, museum curator, researcher, historian, professor, ethnographer. When we start with the passions first, the career possibilities expand. But guess what? Nobody's recruiting on campus for these things. So we have to teach them how to actually go find these opportunities and possibilities, okay? <coughs> so this person, she actually ended up becoming an HR recruiter. Instead of digging through piles of rubble, she digs through piles of resumes. <laughs> Instead of studying ancient culture, she studies her company's cultures to see if college graduates are fit for her company's culture. She does everything that our archaeologist does, but she's not called an archaeologist. The title is not what matters. What matters is whether or not you are doing what you love on a daily basis. But some of us are so fixated on the title, okay? So if a student comes to you and says, this is what their interest is, I'm interested in chess, bargains, events, people, travel, education, business, health. You holding a space of infinite possibility, okay, let's run with that. Okay? I have a friend who was interested in chess uh, at Stanford Business School, and what did he do? He went on to create chess.com, a multi-million dollar company. But if somebody came to you and said, I'm uh, passionate about chess, and they weren't Bobby Fischer, you might cut their possibility off because you don't know how they would monetize that. That's for you to expand as somebody who is stepping in the space of holding infinite possibility. Okay? When we look at the companies out there that are connected to designing fruit baskets, there's edible arrangements. But then who does it with chocolate? Ghirardelli. Who does it with dry goods? Buffalo Bills Jerky. Again, these companies aren't recruiting on campus, but these are possibilities for a student whose passion that really is. So we have to teach them how to network to get in the door, how to use the alumni office to get into the door, to find somebody, to find a connection there, et cetera. Okay? <coughs> Strategy number two, look for the problems, not the jobs. We've been trying to help students find jobs, and in the future, we're going to help them find problems. Okay? We need to teach them the entrepreneurial mindset. I know we've had this messaging, uh, you've heard follow your passion. Then you also have this other narrative with the starving artist. Right? And so here's the thing, follow your passion and the money will follow. That's not the whole truth. The whole truth is follow your passion, make it into a skill, and then the money will follow. This is the part everybody skips. <laughs> And making something to a skill requires 10,000 hours of practice, 10,000 hour rule, right? You have to actually achieve mastery at that thing. And then I guarantee there's going to be economic possibility for you. You can't just say, oh, I love doing it. Okay, how many, how many, how many hours have you done it this week? Oh, I've been, I've been too busy. That's not really your passion then, okay? So this is the key to making this work. <coughs> Joey Chestnut got paid $10,000 for eating, I think, 62 hot dogs in 12 minutes. And the reason I put this up here is because, guess what, as, as absurd as that is, he found an economic model to get paid five figures for eating hot dogs. So if he can get paid for eating hot dogs, we can help a Columbia, Baruch, NYU student get paid for some other skill set that they have. 
<laughs> so just hold this example in your mind when you think there's no way this kid can make money doing this. Just hold Joey Chestnut in your mind, okay? <laughs> this is the, like the lowest part of the totem pole, okay? <laughs> there's only up from there, <laughs> okay? So you already um, gave me the income equation. Many of you didn't know the income equation. I just want to put it up here really quickly again so you all know. You have to prove to a company that you're going to increase their revenues or be able to decrease their expenses more than you're going to ask for in salary. If you can come to my company and show me how you're going to save me $50,000 or $60,000, I'll happily pay you forty dollars today. <laughs> right? So we have to know this equation. And we have to get students to think in this way. Now, when you look at uh, looking for problems in a company or an individual, there's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and then there's organizations. So individuals, they have problems around psychological needs, safety needs, belonging and love needs, esteem needs, and self-actualization. What kind of companies operate on the physiological needs level? Food, water, warmth, rest. Utilities, great. Hotel, great. Who operates on safety and needs? Cybersecurity, law enforcement, right? Social security protection um, companies. Uh, who operates on belonging and love needs? Facebook, <laughs> eHarmony, e eHarmony. Okay, Cupid. What? I don't know what those dating things are, but uh, yeah, they operate there. And guess where colleges operate? They operate on the steam needs and self-actualization, or they're supposed to. <laughs> okay. Now, companies also have problems in terms of marketing and sales, systems and processes, finance, and people. And within the, each of those, there are subsidiaries. So you actually need to be able to teach them how to look at the world and find problems. Because everywhere there's a problem, there is an opportunity. Okay. So you remember these when you're growing up? Highlight magazines? This is the exact same way you have to teach them to look at the world. It's all there. It's all in front of you. You may not be able to see it at first glance, but there's problems here. There's problems here, and I need you to actually go look for the problems. Because if you're able to identify a problem that you want to solve, there's going to be economic possibility. And in fact, their wealth and our wealth will always be to, uh, directly proportional to the size of the problems we solve. This Occupy Wall Street thing, I didn't buy it. Because guess what? Bill Gates, he didn't do anything wrong. He just solved a big problem. He solved a big problem. If you solve a small problem like flipping burgers, you can only get paid so much. If you solve a big problem, your wealth is going to be directly proportional to the size of the problem you solve. Okay? So <clears throat> when economy goes down, because guess what? We're at a peak right now, and it will go down while you are in this profession. Okay? When economy goes down, what happens to problems? Problems increase or decrease? Increase. Okay? When the problems increase, what happens to opportunities? Increase or decrease? Yes. Opportunity to increase. We just said it. Everywhere there's a problem, there's a new opportunity. <laughs> now, the weaker people, not weaker, the people who are not ready, they will not be able to take advantage of those opportunities. Because when the economy goes down, it just means you have to solve higher level and more difficult problems. But if you were able to solve higher level and more difficult problems in a down economy, you were going to flourish. <laughs> you're going to flourish. So those low-hanging fruit jobs that most college graduates were getting in the past, those won't be there. <laughs> those won't be there. And if you go ask a law student like from, uh, who didn't go to a top like 50 law school, they went to law school, but they're not employed. <coughs> they're not employed in law. Right? So these career paths that we thought were sustainable and would be here forever and were always a good thing, they're not working out in that way. So problems equal opportunity. Okay? You got to turn limits and lemonade. Strategy three. You will teach real skills. You as career services will actually start teaching real life skills that go, go with them forever. Their major and that test that they took is not going to last them forever. I don't remember anything from my Stanford MBA. There's not like a skill that I could trace back to that moment. Okay? But you actually will actually be teaching them skills. I see you all being having your own classes. In the same way the Career Design Lab has their offices in Times Square, I see you all having your own classes, and those classes being flooded. Flooded, because that's what students are really coming for. They, they would bypass all these books and this academics and this major stuff if they could, but they think that they have to go through that to get to the job. I see you being at the forefront and having full classes, and you'll be curriculum developers, and you'll be teaching real skills. <coughs> now, there's two things. There's skills or subject mastery. 
Okay. Phil Jackson had subject mastery. Michael Jordan had skill mastery. Skill mastery is the ability to move an individual, organization, or object from its current point A toward towards the desired point B faster, safer, and easier, and be able to replicate that process better than the average person. Okay. I was going to use New York Knicks example, but they're so bad I can't <laughs> even use them. Um, <coughs> Raptors. So the reason somebody's able to play um, in uh, professional basketball because they can make a three pointer more repeatedly and more accurately than everyone in here, right? If we were able to replicate success in the same way that they could, we might be playing there. So this is what skill mastery is, is the ability to replicate success. Not just do it once, but to replicate it and do it over and over and over again. Subject mastery is like a TED talk. It's the ability to shift the understanding of an individual organization from its current point A to or towards its desired point B regards a specific body of knowledge. I hope that today I'm actually shifting your understanding of what career services is, okay? So I'm engaged in subject mastery today. Now I have skill mastery within this realm as well, but today we're engaged in subject mastery. So I like to use ING words for skills. I like to think about things as actions. Just like we did with passions, you want to think about them as actions, right? So what is your skill? Imagining new solutions, inventing new ideas, resolving conflicts, constructing buildings, dispensing information, sketching charts or diagrams, writing for publications, creating new ideas, handling complaints, right? These are skills. And most of our students actually are graduating without any real skills. So <coughs> here's the skills values matrix. Okay? These are things that lots of people can do. These are things that few people can do. These are things that are very easy. These are things that are very difficult. I've only found one thing that lots of people can do that's very difficult, and that's giving birth. Okay? So shout out to all the ladies in the room. Unfortunately, unless you're a surrogate, you don't get paid for that, though. Okay? Um, celebrities, what, I think it's like $60,000 to be a surrogate or something like that? More? Okay. So our students, most of their skills are down here. Navigating Facebook, setting up a Facebook fan page. Okay? You don't get paid for those. You don't get paid for, uh, well for anything below this line. Where we want to help them develop a skill is here, right? And this would be something like growing a Facebook fan page. Because guess what? Social media marketing manager, $108,000. They're on Facebook all day. They're on social media all day, but they're solving a problem in the environment of Facebook. There's nothing wrong with social media. Are you solving a problem within the context of social media, though? Okay? Tying a shoe. We all know how to tie our shoes. Polishing a shoe. How many know how to polish a shoe? Okay, $5, $10 in the airport, right? You can get paid, just not a lot. How about spray painting a shoe? Anybody know how to do that in here? Look at this. Converse All Stars, $55 blank on Zappos, $400 on Etsy because this person knows how to spray paint a shoe with an amazing design. No college degree required, but they know how to do something in that green box. Okay? So, <coughs> For a long time, we've been training students to try to prove to employers that they can do what the next person to them can do. And that's not where your real value is. Showing somebody that I can do what she can do or what he can do, that's not where your real value is. Your real value is in actually showing them the one thing that you can do that nobody else in this room can do. That's where your real value is, in that one or two things that you can do that nobody else in this room can do as well as you. Not showing them that, look at me, I, I got a GPA like this, I passed this test, I did this. That's not where your value is. Your value is in what makes you unique and distinct. And so we have to help them uncover that when we look at their life from a bird's eye view. Okay? Strategy four, you will become personal branders. Okay? And it will be the game of show, not tell. Okay? <coughs> Companies don't care about this. They don't care about this anymore and the future of career services. Students will have to prove their value. It won't just be assumed that just because you went to this school that you are valuable. Okay? This is, is going to be the old days. Okay? So again, it's not showing other people that I can do what the person next to me can do. It's going to be actually identifying the one thing that you can do that nobody else around you can do. Right? The reason Caesar was king in Planet of the Apes is because he could talk, and only one other ape could talk. That's what made him unique and distinct. So what's beautiful is that for most of the students that walk into your office, what makes us unique and distinct, we don't recognize it because it comes so naturally to us. We think that everybody in the world can do what we can do. <laughs> but it's not until people like you hold up a mirror to them and say, you know what you just did was absolutely amazing. And there aren't many students on this campus or that I've ever met that actually can do what you just did. That's your responsibility to hold up that mirror to them and show them that one or two things that makes them unique.
you give them that little gift and that's gonna take them in their career on a trajectory of success. You can look at their life from a um, unbiased, because their parents are looking at their lives with bias, okay? They have personal agendas. You get to look at their life from an unbiased place and say, wow, I've seen a lot of students come through here and there's something about you, your leadership skills are unprecedented. Your speaking skills are unprecedented. Your writing skills are unprecedented. Your marketing skills are unprecedented. You get to share that language back to them, reflect that back to them. In the same way that a mother might take her daughter to the mirror after she puts her wedding dress on and let her know how beautiful she is in that moment, you get to do that exact same thing for students with their skills and the things that you see in them that make them unique, okay? <coughs> so as we think about personal branding, it's not gonna be about talk. A lot of people use, the, 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 excuse me, the thesaurus when they are writing their resumes, right? And then they don't even, they use the, the, the thesaurus, excuse me, and then they don't even know what the word means that they use from the, the, the source. Why do I keep messing that up, the source? Right, they go change all these words, and then they don't even know what the word actually means anymore. Because <laughs> employers, when, you're, when they see all this beautiful language on a resume, what they're really thinking is like, do I actually believe this person? Do I believe this person? Because it's just words. It's just words, okay? And so what they want to do, what, what's gonna be more helpful is for them to prove their value. And so the way I language that is your artifacts and evidence of success. When you look at these pyramids, what do they say about the people who built them? What do they say? Huh? Slaves, really slaves architects. Vision. Huh? Huh? They had vision. Vision. Lasting. Lasting results. Astrologists. Big thinkers. Right? So without the Egyptians here to tell you about themselves, their artifacts actually speak for them. Okay? So, in a way, you are going to be archaeologists in the same way. You remember Show and Tell Day when you were a little kid? You had to bring a toy and talk about it. Imagine coming to Show and Tell Day and um, you forgot your fire truck in the car, but it's your turn. And teacher calls you up and you're like, hey, everybody, I forgot my toy truck in the car, but I'm going to talk about it. They're going to boo you off stage, right? Because you're supposed to show and tell. You're supposed to show and tell. And so, the same thing with Careers, like when we're in the interview process or trying to communicate who we are via paper, the best way is to actually figure out how I can show my results, okay? So I'm going to show you some of my artifacts and evidence of success, and you let me know what this tells you about me. <coughs> and I'm not even going to speak. So based on those images, what do you what do you believe about me now? Communicator. Communicator. Connector. Connector. Self-efficacy. Self motivated. What? Committed. So without me saying anything, my artifacts and evidence of success spoke on my behalf. Right? This is the power of a personal brand. Your personal brand is what people think about you when you are not present. Okay? And so as you are helping students, we need to figure out what they can take into the interview that they can make flat, okay? So pictures, or documents, or PowerPoints, or letters of recommendation, or proposals, business plans, charts and graphs, awards, news articles that they wrote, marketing plans, videos, products that they created, ads, what can they actually make flat and take into the interview with them? So rather than speaking about this thing that I did on campus, why, uh, I'll just dig into my briefcase and actually slide it across the table so you can see it. So you don't have to guess about what it is and come up with your own imagery. I'm actually going to give you the imagery, and then you can make your own choice and decision about what you think about me based on what you're seeing. Does that make sense? And so we have to help them create not only this portfolio, but you have to be archaeologists and help them dig it out. Because sometimes these things, uh, they're there, but they have to be dug out. <coughs> so this is the final strategy. Final strategy is that the city will become your campus. You all won't work in offices or on campus anymore. You will get up from home and you will be out in the city, enjoying it, meeting people, connecting. You will be matchmakers, but not in the dating sense, but from a career perspective, okay? So when you look at the city, this is not New York, but when you look at the city, you will be the ones who know all the no-name companies. 
Everybody knows the big companies that come on campus and recruit at every single campus all across the country. You will know all the no-name companies that actually have amazing opportunities that are a perfect fit for some of the young people that walk into your office. Some of your days will just be spent around going and introducing yourself, researching companies on, uh, on your phone, seeing what kind of employment opportunities you are. You will be starting to become economists of New York and what's going on. Oh, wow, this industry is actually uh, growing over here. Um, and uh, I have some students who might be a fit for this. Um, this is actually going down. This new company just popped up over here, and they're looking for 100 of this. This will be your day-to-day -day and your work. <coughs> When you look at this list, what do you see? Huh? Big names? OK. I heard one person say it. These are all Fortune 100 companies. But these aren't all the, the only sexy one that's up here. Is probably Google. That's probably the only sexy one up there. And I just threw that one in there just to do it. Students could walk by one of these companies, a Fortune 100 company at a career fair, and because they don't know of it, because it's not a sexy household name, they walk by and be like, who, who is McKesson? Uh, if you only knew. <laughs> and so you get to expose them to all these opportunities that aren't on their radar because they're looking for a sexy title that their mom can tell their aunts when she's at a dinner party. Seriously, OK, your daughter's a lawyer, but is she happy? Your daughter works at this company, but is she happy? And of course, you have to break through their parents' limiting um, beliefs around uh, careers. So <coughs> you ever been to In-N-Out in California? OK. How many ready to show of hands? Okay, that's a good burger, right? Mm. I'm vegetarian now, so uh, <laughs> it's all good. Fries are good, though. So when students, come, when students come into careers, this is how they see it. This is how they see it, right? How many of you know about the hidden menu, the secret menu at In-N-Out? Only half of you. Other of you like, what secret menu? <laughs> this is the secret menu at In-N-Out. All the ingredients are here. All the ingredients are here. If you go up and you ask for any of these things at In-N-Out, they will, they will plug it in the computer. But it's not on the main menu. This is career fair. This is career fair. <laughs> this is everything that's actually available and possible. <laughs> And so you want to expose them to the hidden menu as they navigate this city. And so there's a career choice circle, which is the careers you know exist and know, know about. And the truth is, is that no student knows about any career unless they've worked in it for three months or more. You don't really know a career unless you've actually been in it. So they may think they know it because of romantic ideas they got from TV, but they really don't know. Okay? Then there's careers that you know exist, but you know you know nothing about. So I know a paleontologist exists, but I don't know what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And where you're trying to push them before they go through the process of elimination is careers that they don't even know exist. Therefore, they know absolutely nothing about. You want them to be in a space of curiosity. And from the age of 18 to 30, they are literally dating careers. And then, once they're 30, then they can actually commit. They don't have to get it right straight out the gates. This is a process of exploration, OK? So with that, <laughs> um, we have uh, free copies of uh, my book, the interview, uh, the interview, and um, it is available for you at the back. It's a curriculum to guide students through this process, and it takes them through step by step of creating their dream life first, right? Who they are, attracting their dream career, that's their personal brand, building their dream team, which includes you, and then landing their dream job, which is the interview process. So I'll be happy to sign those in the back, but I want to leave you with this last summary. In the future, career services will help students discover or decide who they want to be, find what they love to do find a problem to solve, master a marketable skill, and identify employment and entrepreneurial opportunities, not just employment opportunities. This is what I believe the future of career services is. There will be less resumes and more results. There will be less leather pad folios and more online portfolios. There will be less career fairs and more career fairy tales, less employment, more entrepreneurship, less on-campus recruiting, more independent career searches, less interviews, more interviewing, and less focus on jobs, and more focus on joy. I believe that you will all save higher education. This bubble is going to burst. It's been the housing bubble. It's been the tech bubble. This one is next. I believe that you all will save higher education, um, and the skill is your heart. That's you actually giving a, you know what? 
this is how you've been positioned for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Legacy departments, the board, sports programs, and then here you are at the end. We don't care about you. We're going to put you in some office way over there. Okay? But at the end of the day, when all is said and done, when all is said and done, you will save higher education. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much. I wish you the best. Let's give Julian one more big round of applause. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. It, he, he has five other books, too. So a lot of us struggle with passion, like how to help a student find passion. He has a passion finder, um, which I found very helpful in Eight Cylinders of Success. So please check that out. Let's open it up to QA. Who's got questions? Yeah, I'm in the sciences, so I help students who are interested in health professions. And it seems to me that for most, except for the new tech sort of thing, careers, we still use the same old resume. I mean, I don't think, I, it's still the old model, you know, still the academic, the, the resume, the research, whatever. And it's, so I, I don't know anything about the video business card you mentioned, but I, you know, and so if you have any ideas about how it's changed in science or health professions, I'd be curious. Yeah, so I, I don't, um, I, I stayed away from STEM. <laughs> <laughs> I stayed away from that side of campus, um, but uh, that presentation's I, next. Uh, yeah. Video business card is uh, coming up yeah, right video after business this. Card's coming up, but um, uh, regardless, I think um, I think some of the the bottom of the pyramid, the lower end jobs, the low hanging fruits, those are going to go. And so, regardless, the student is going to have to figure out how they make themselves distinct when they're competing for the same amount of limited jobs, right? So. For me, personal branding is really still key to the process, but it's also you exposing them to uh, the companies that don't recruit on campus, the, the people who aren't Bayer, the people who aren't Johnson & Johnson, and the innovative healthcare companies that they might actually have to fly to Seattle or California to actually go have an interview. And a student will be like, oh, it's convenient just to show up and go interview with Bayer. But if you really think that there's a fit or you have a relationship there where you can make an introduction, you might have to encourage a student, like, this is a real opportunity for you. It's only 20 people at this company, and they're looking for three people at this level, and this might be a fit for you. This is where your work comes in to support them and seeing the entire landscape of healthcare, not just the traditional incumbent players. Yeah. For those that don't know, Julian is also the CEO of masterminds.org. And mentorship is a very big topic at every higher education institution, especially among career services. So. Uh, I learned about mastermind groups um, from Julian, who uh, is an expert in them. I highly encourage you to th consider them. We are piloting student and career mastermind groups, student and alumni career mastermind groups, uh, which are really mentor circles, which has been really effective. And Julian actually did the training for my team um, in the fall. Other questions? Hi, um, I think your idea about teaching a student to how to solve problems really resonates with me. I've also worked with entrepreneurial-minded students before, and that's something that I found really works for them. And what I've tried to encourage them is to set up informational interviews with people who work at the companies they like to work for to try to understand those problems. But what else can they do if for some reason that's not working out? to understand what those pro the problems that, that, that those companies are facing. Yeah, so uh, the biggest thing is a Google alert. Um, set up a Google alert around the language pattern around that problem so that they're actually getting a news feed every single day. Rather than going to Instagram first or their Facebook feed, they're actually going to their Google alert and they're getting up-to-date uh, up day-to-day -day information about what's going on in that industry. As they read that on a daily basis and that becomes a habit, they're going to be able to start to see where the holes are, where companies are struggling in that particular industry. That is the easiest way to actually uh, build up their knowledge about that industry and the problems that uh, the problems and opportunities that are available there. Yeah. Let's take one or two more questions, and uh, I think Julian's going to stick around for a little yes, while. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. So my name is Tiffany. I work um, at the Columbia School of Social Work as the yes. Assistant Director of Career Services. Yes. And so I know you were talking about the future of career services and what mm -hmm. that would look like. What's your take on networking? 
my take on networking. Um, so I believe in networking up is the most powerful form of networking that a young person can be doing right now. But it has to be give, 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 give. Um, most people have the take mentality when it comes to networking. What can I get from this person? Um, the way I've built my mentorship relationships is I've literally, um, I've gone as far as one of my biggest clients. Uh, he came to New York, and um, I got an introduction to him. And I offered to pay for his cab ride to the airport. I know he's busy. He doesn't have time. But I know he has to get to the airport, and I'm going to pay for his cab ride, and I'm going to bring him a cup of coffee. And in that 30 minutes, we closed a business deal. Mm -hmm. So that was unorthodox networking. It wasn't me going to a networking event to meet people, right? It was me being really gr a gorilla in terms of my marketing and, and getting somebody's attention and um, taking all the objections that they might have about meeting me off the table so that uh, we could actually have an open conversation. So the traditional networking events, like those are usually not effective. I don't have business cards, right? Like I don't, do, uh, that's not how I network anymore. Um, and I'm always seeking to give or solve a problem for somebody that's gonna make their life easier. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. So I'll just uh, conclude with this. Uh, you might know this from the Bible. Uh, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. I believe that right now many of you are last as career service departments. You're last in the student's mind until it's too late. You're last on the budget line item for the school. But I believe that eventually you will be first because students are here to get jobs, right? They know that the education and the information that they're getting is already outdated. And so the number one thing that they're really here to get is jobs. And I think eventually you get moved up and up and up until you become first and you become the face of the university, not the academics. So thank you. Thank you very much. Did you guys enjoy that? I told you it was going to shake things up. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, also, as we talk about careers, you know, nowadays we know that the next generation is going to have many careers, up to 17. In fact, you know, three or four at the same time. And my next book is actually called Career Bucket List, and Julian is writing the forward of it. So you can hear more about his thoughts on that. Um, we are actually going to, we had a break, um, uh, which we went, we went a little bit over time. So what we're going to do is we're going to improvise a bit. Uh, we have four breakouts for you. They're all really great topics. And I think some of us may have, maybe leading to one or two, but we thought, let's all have it in the same room, right? Let's have it here. Um, I apologize to some of the speakers who might have to you know, cut their presentations a little bit, but we'll try to please um, uh, allow them you know, sufficient time to present their ideas and, and allow for a discussion. Um, so that way you, you get exposed to four different areas. Those areas are mentorship and the alumni connector, the video business card, which is coming up next, career outcomes, and Career Readiness IQ. So without further ado, let's actually get, let's take a quick break, two or three minutes, run to the restroom, grab some drinks, and we'll actually get our next presentation set up. <laughs>